Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Anu Joshi and I'm a real estate broker based in Toronto in the GTA. This video is number two of a four part series that I'm doing that basically distills and explains to you the housing policies and housing platform of the four major political parties uh, here in Ontario in advance of next week's provincial election. In the description box below, I'm going to put the links for all, uh, all four videos. On this video, we're going to be talking about the Ontario Liberals platform. And I'm going to be discussing the policies that they have as a part of their plan and their platform that relate to housing. So um, I have a background in real estate, obviously. Um, I'm a real estate broker. And uh, for those of you that don't know, I actually have a political science degree. I uh, graduated from York University in Let's not talk about the year, um, let's not get into specifics, but uh, basically combining my political science background and my current uh, industry, which is real estate, super passionate about public policy, um, encouraging all of you guys to go out and vote, not telling you which way to vote, um, but just basically distilling the housing policy as I understand it so that you can understand it and make an educated decision. Uh, please do go read the platforms for all the public parties, um, sorry, all the political parties uh, before you cast your vote. And please do cast your vote. I already have um, in either advanced polling or on election day on June 2nd. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's get into it. Um, now, the last video that I did was for the Ontario PC party, which was a little bit different only because they are the current party that's in power. And so they didn't really release a platform as such. It was not an election platform. Uh, but what I went through was the um, the March 2022 budget that they released, which had their housing plan and, and what they're planning to do and all of the policies that they're planning to institute. Now, with the Liberal Party platform, it's a little bit different. They have created this beautiful document um, that really lays out what it is that they're going to be doing. Um, let me talk to you about the policies that relate to housing. So number one that I see here is that they, the Ontario Liberals want to bring back rent control. So rent control basically, in essence, um, puts a cap to the rent and the amount that it can go up. So in Ontario, as you know, um, currently we do have rent control. Uh, there are exemptions um, that were put in place for certain properties. So it really depends on the age of the property, when it was first occupied as a rental unit, when the first tenant came in, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's so many exceptions. The Liberals think that this creates a two-tiered rental system, which I don't completely agree with, um, but they wanna bring back rent control. OK, um, reinstating rent control everywhere in Ontario and preventing rent hikes. So uh, obviously preventing rate, rent hikes would mean that um, landlords would not be able to just arbitrarily put your rent rates up. Um, in Ontario, as far as I know, you can't do that. The Ontario government releases every year a certain um, percentage that the landlords can raise the rent and it's only it can only be done once every 12 months, like 12 months from the last rent increase. And it can uh, only be done up to a max of the percentage specified. So if I'm not wrong, um, I think the 2022 percentage was like 1.2%, right? So if you have um, like a rental, like a condo on rent, one of my clients has one that's $2,400. 1.2% 1 is like 25 or 28 bucks. OK, so the landlord is not like making huge money, right, by increasing rent by twenty eight dollars a month. Twenty eight dollars is like nothing like you go to McDonald's and you don't know what to buy. You are going to end up spending twenty eight dollars. Right? One of that, one of that, one of that. Um, so twenty eight dollars is not huge, but I do understand that it feeds into this whole system um, of raising rents and, and landlord and tenant relations. Now, if people follow the rules, right, and only raise it that specific amount, $28 in this example, we won't really have a problem, right? Inflation is at an all time high. I know gas is expensive. I know groceries are expensive. I'm a consumer too, right? People look at us as the big bad realtors, but literally I have to buy groceries and feed my family as well. Um, besides the point, if everyone follows the rules, which is really what it comes down to, um, the policy that we have right now seems to work, I think, um, as far as, as my understanding. What is happening is that uh, something called like renovations, right? And and the 
Ontario PCs don't have a plan for this and the Ontario Liberals don't have a plan for this either. Rent evictions are basically, it's an exception to the rent increase, right? So the 1.2% that I said, um, and, and mind you, in 2020 and 2021, there was a, a rent increase freeze. So all across Ontario, you could not, as a landlord, you could not raise your rent, not even 1%, okay? And in 2022, it was 1%. Um, getting back to the point, which was, if everyone follows the rent increase rules, it would be fine. But there are exceptions. And one of these exceptions is that if a landlord is making substantial renovations to the unit, um, they can raise the rent for their tenant above and beyond the specified Ontario guidelines. So the Ontario guideline was 1.2%, like I said, um, or one point something, don't quote me on that. Um, but to raise it beyond that, you have to do some substantial capital renovations. So now what some landlords are doing is just to get their low paying low rent paying tenants out, they're saying, oh, we're going to make substantial renovations to property, you get out, right? And like, it really depends what you would look at as a substantial renovation. For me, changing like the countertops in your kitchen is not a substantial renovation, right? You you demolish, like you pick up the countertop, you install a new one, it's like a, it's like a one day job, right? That's not necessarily substantial. Yeah, if you're building a new basement apartment or if you are ripping up the kitchen completely and putting in a brand new kitchen or same with the bathroom, that that might be seen as substantial. But something called reno evictions is happening where landlords are saying that they're going to do like crazy renos. And so based on that, they give notice to their tenant, the tenant moves out and then the landlord really doesn't do anything, just slaps on some paint and then rents it out at the market rate, which is now higher. Um, so that is not something that should happen. Neither of these, the, the two that I've looked at so far, the political platforms address this, but I digress. I way digressed. I think I talked for like five minutes on night digression. But anyway, um, back to the liberal platform. Um, the liberals want to also give renters a clear path to ownership. Um, they said that they'll create a legal framework that provides protections and certainty for owners and renters to opt into rent to own agreements. So rent to own agreements already exist. Um, I had a colleague at my office that used to do them. They were very popular back in the day, not so popular now, just because of market trends, right? It's more beneficial for an investor that's facilitating a rent to own to rather not do rent to own and just like sell it on the free market. Right. Um, and so I think it's valuable. Uh, you know, as a tool for certain um, the, like tenants, right? It's, it would absolutely be helpful. I think it's a great program, but the market situation that we're in right now doesn't really make it beneficial for the other party, right? So I know a ton of tenants that would be in like, would be um, uh, jumping onto the opportunity to participate in a rent to own program. However, that has two parts to it, right? You have the tenant prepared to do the rent to own, but there has to be a landlord or an investor or a government body that's ready to do and rent to own. So this is the part of um, the puzzle that's missing. So the liberals say that they want to create, create a legal framework that will allow this to happen. That would be fantastic in my opinion. It will help a lot of families, a lot of first time home buyers, a lot of people that are in the rental market trying to get into the, into, you know, homes of their own home ownership. I think it would be fantastic if the Liberal government is able to address both sides of that. Um, I think that would be great. Next up, they, similar to the, um, the Ontario PCs, they have said that they're going to be getting 1.5 million new homes built over the next 10 years. So identical target. Um, I'm going to just go through it a little here. However, um, neither of the parties have really released details on how exactly they're going to make that happen. Right. And as I said on my previous video, 1.5 million homes in 10 years is not an easy feat. Um, we in, in, rec in recent times, we have had record number of new home starts, right? But you have to take into account that the new home starts, if they're building condos in downtown Toronto, that are like studios of 500 square feet or less, families are not living there. Couples are not living there. Singles are barely living there, right? Um, and so we really have to talk about these 1.5 million new homes. It's an ambitious target. It's a great target. And I hope that the Liberal government has a plan um, to be able to achieve that because that would be fantastic. We desperately need that supply. I just hope it's the right type of supply. The next thing um, that they're talking about is that they're going to build 108 
138,000 deeply affordable homes, including 78,000 new social and community homes, and 38,000 homes in supportive housing, and 22,000 new homes for Indigenous peoples. So this is also a very big number, right? 138,000 homes. Um, and they use the term deeply affordable. Now, it's hard to define what affordable means, right? Government subsidized affordable housing is different from market affordable, right? Is different from market, is different from, you know. So there's a couple of different categories that definitely need to be addressed. What I think that they're talking about is projects that I believe would come from, uh, you know, initiated by the government. And um, so the 130,000 new deeply affordable homes, which they're talking about, um, would be in addition to retaining and repairing the tens of thousands of existing affordable homes. And again, I, I assume that this is part of the government infrastructure or, or through government partners, like um, I, Toronto Community Housing, for example, is, I think that's the, the name. Um, it's a government adjacent organization. And I'm sure other regions and other municipalities have similar ones. Uh, they said that uh, they'll aim to end the wait list for affordable public housing by building 138,000 homes. And they'll also work with partners to, <coughs> excuse me, make sure that these newly built homes create more ownership options for marginalized communities. So uh, this is a very important and very promising uh, part of the platform, certainly. Um, we need market housing, obviously the, the demand fairly outpaces supply um, and we see that you know whether prices are up or prices are down sales are still happening right prices went down and um, we're, we're down in April compared to February uh, in the GTA but sales were all over the place there were more than 8,000 sales right so people still need to buy homes they want to buy homes there's a demand for it we need to be able to offer supply um, what doesn't get talked about in the free market or you know the the reports that are on um on cp24 and you hear you know treb is reporting such and such treb looks at um at market housing so private owners individuals investors whatever it is right um buying and selling homes however what the government is talking about here i believe is the deeply affordable sector um there is a great need you know, to, to do that. And again, it, the plan does not go into any detail, which is unfortunate uh, because I would have loved to know how they're going to do it. And then if it's a feasible plan, then absolutely, you know, irrespective of the government that comes into, into power, this is something that needs to be addressed, right? Affordable housing. So um, that was kind of good to see, um, but no details. So we'll, we'll kind of see what happens. Uh, just under the housing sector, uh, uh, proposal, they've also said that by doing the 1.5 million new homes over the next 10 years, including these deeply affordable ones, um, they're planning to create 150,000 new jobs, which is fantastic. And I'll allude to um, something that ARIA, the Ontario Real Estate Association, uh, talks about a lot is that realtors, you know, whatever reputation we have in the community, uh, real estate as a business, as an industry, helps fuel the economy right? It helps move people. Um, it helps house people. It helps move the economy along. Um, one of the fastest and, uh, and biggest growing sectors throughout the pandemic, supporting the economy here, right? People always need homes. Um, and then they need people to build them. So the construction, uh, renovation business, all of those sort of sector workers are, are also doing fairly well. So I'm happy to see that, you know, and I, and I wanted to highlight that through the, the Liberal plan, they're planning to create 150,000 new jobs. Another thing that they're um, planning to do is that the Ontario Liberals will tax homes that are currently sitting empty, especially for non-Canadian owners. So um, this is interesting because we already have a vacant home tax coming into effect in the city of Toronto, as I mentioned previously. Um, some other municipalities are looking at doing it as well. The first one that did it in Canada, as far as I know, was in Vancouver. Um, they taxed vacant homes and the the um, 
approach or the, the point of a vacant homes tax is to make sure that those vacant homes are not really sitting vacant for no reason, right? Um, if builders or investors or someone's just like sitting and holding that property, uh, we need supply, right? There's a dire need for supply. So we want those units actually to come onto the market. So having a vacant homes tax, um, it should pinch those owners that are keeping it vacant for no reason to either put it on rent or to sell it. Um, you know, there's a ton of first time buyers that need homes, right? Um, that could be helped by having this extra inventory in the market. So that, um, that is the vacant homes tax. Now the Ontario government is saying, the PCs said it and liberals are saying it that they're gonna be uh, doing this. Also, the Ontario liberals are saying that they're going to ban new non-resident ownership, which means foreign buyers cannot buy in Ontario, which is very interesting compared to what we have currently. We had the non-resident speculation tax, which is which was 15%, got raised to 20% by, the, um, uh, by Doug Ford and the Conservatives that are currently in power. And now the Liberal government, Stephen Del Duca, is saying that they're gonna ban new non-resident ownership completely. So no foreign buyers. So keep in mind, as I mentioned before, only Canadian citizens and permanent residents are considered Canadians right? Um, if you have a work permit, no matter how many years you've been in the country, if you have a work permit or if you have a student permit or a visa, or if you're not even, uh, sorry, visitor visa, or if you're not even in the country, all of those categories are considered foreign buyers. So the liberal proposal to ban them completely, interesting, bold. Um, but I will say this, as far as I know, foreign ownership only constitutes about, uh, it's less than 5% of the ownership in uh, the GTA. Um, I don't know what the number is for all of Toronto, um, uh, sorry, all of Ontario, but I reckon it would be similar or less. Um, so banning them completely, I don't know how much of an impact it's going to have, but definitely a bold move. Another thing the Ontario Liberal, blah, blah, it's been a day. Um, another thing the Ontario Liberals are saying is that they're going to introduce a use it or lose it tax on developers sitting on land ready for development. So I love this one. I have been waiting for this one. Um, I think this is a fantastic policy that if they were to bring this into effect, we have builders, right? There's these huge groups um, of, and they don't even have to be builders, but just investors, right? They go out and they buy land. Um, they buy land everywhere and then they just sit on it, right? And you can do that. Like if you have money and, and you have nowhere to put it, put it in land. I'm a big believer in land. I, I completely, I'm there with you. But what happens is when we're in an, uh, you know, a society where we have a grave need for housing, we have these builders sitting and earning, um, you know, thousands of dollars a day, every day that they sit on it, every day that they don't develop it, every day that they don't sell those homes, um, they're getting money. But the situation is that our society is is losing patience and just going crazy over the housing situation that we've sort of built ourselves into. And so I love this use it or lose it tax. Um, you know, if the land is ready to go, if the municipality is ready to approve your plans, if there's a need for housing in that area, which everywhere there is, um, build it, right? So you won't make like, hundreds of millions you'll still make tens of millions um you know build it we need homes so i i really really like this one um i'm trying to be impartial but obviously um being so passionate about public policy being so passionate about real estate and actually seeing the impact that it has on my clients um and reading about this public policy and everything i'm obviously more passionate and, and part of me cannot be impartial. So forgive me, it's not any sort of political leaning, um, but I'm just talking about the policies and how I feel about the policies themselves. Uh, the other thing that they've said is that they wanna combat money laundering in the housing market. So absolutely um, in support of this, um, money laundering is bad. It happens in other countries, it probably happens in Canada and we'd love to be able to stop it right? Um, so that would be that would be an absolute good thing. What they've said that they, for a long time, that the Canadian housing market has been identified as a place for foreign investors to park money. Um, again, I'll go back to what I believe to be true, that not, um, not a huge percentage 
of ownership in Ontario and in the GTA is foreign, not a huge not a huge amount. Um, majority of it is local, but anyways, we'll, we'll move on. Um, they said that they're going to introduce meaningful legislation to stop money laundering, especially as it relates to the housing market, and create a publicly accessible beneficial home ownership registry, which will crack down on bad actors, including pre-construction condo sales, to ensure condo flippers pay appropriate taxes. So that's actually a different point. I don't know who wrote this document, but anyway, let's go one at a time. Uh, beneficial ownership registry. Now, I feel some things about this. Um, beneficial ownership registry, basically the land registry, even right now, if you go to the land registry, you can find out who owns XYZ home, right? Um, you can find out the name of the, the person or the name of the company that owns any, any property anywhere, as far as I know. I've done it before um, for a client, but I, I think it's open to the public. What the beneficial ownership registry is proposing, from my understanding, is that it's going to show the humans behind the name. So what that means is um, if a company owns a property, like let's say it's just like a regular detached home, right? Somewhere in the GTA, um, but it's on a company name. In the land registry, it's going to say that company name, right? Because that company is the legal owner of that property. What to my understanding, what a beneficial ownership registry is, is that it's going to show above and beyond the land registry, it's going to show who are the directors and the shareholders in that company that owns that property. Now, I don't really see how this makes sense. Um, I mean, it can be open to the government maybe, but really why does John, who lives on you know Main Street, need to know, okay, three doors down, what's the name of the person that owns that? Like, you want to know who lives there, knock the door, bring them a peach cobbler and say, hey, I'm John, welcome to the community, right? Um, that's old school. Like, I've met my neighbors that way. But why does it need to be in a registry, right? Um, I just, I don't understand the point of it. Uh, surely we do need to crack down on money laundering, but listen, if a corporation or an individual wants to launder money and they've got like a mortgage or a bank or something that's doing it and it's already registered on title, bro, you're already too late. So um, might not be a popular opinion, might get some hate for that. I don't really care. Um, if someone can tell me why a beneficial homeownership registry would be beneficial, um, that would be great. But to me, it just sounds like infringing on someone's privacy, right? Um, like I have a client, I'm not gonna say who, let's just say me, okay? Me, I buy a property, um, and I buy it on, you know, uh, a corporation name. I'm the only shareholder. It's my corporation. I've just bought it for, for tax purposes, right? It just makes more sense to structure my business that way because it's an investment property, right? Like I don't live there. Um, it's an investment property. And so um, I bought it on a corporation name. Completely legal. Tons of people do it. Completely allowed. 100% supported by the Canadian government. Everything's good, right? Why? Why should somebody be able to Google the, you know, the condo I own and be like, hey, ABC company, who owns this? Oh, I knew Joshi owns it. Why does someone need to know that? Like my bank knows it. The CRA knows it. The government can know it. If you really want to, sure, the government can know that information. I have no issues. But why does John down the street from my property need to know? Why? I don't know. Somebody explain it to me. So I think that that's pretty dumb. I'll say it. It is what it is. Um, but if someone can explain to me why it makes sense, I'm, I'm open to listening. Uh, another thing that they want to do is that in ensure that condo flippers pay appropriate taxes. This, yes, fantastic one. Um, as you know, condo flipping and in general property flipping has become a huge thing, um, which flipping basically refers to... Um, I'll talk about it in terms of pre-construction, right? So an investor or someone that's not an end user goes and books a condo, right? When the builder first releases it, they book it, they put the initial deposit, they sign, blah, blah, blah. And the closing is in like two years. And so at the end of this year, instead of waiting for the closing, at the end of this year, they say, okay, we're going to assign this contract to another buyer. And so basically you're selling a piece of paper, the piece of paper that's the ownership for the future, uh, future home or future condo, right? Um, and so that assignment of that purchase contract is called an assignment sale. And so these are super popular. So what the investor does is that they get the deposit that they paid, they get that out of it, 
And if that building or if that area or if that unit has appreciated between when they bought it and when they're selling it on assignment, if it's appreciated, they get a higher price for it. So that cream on top, basically that's their income, right? They, they've made money off of it. They've made profit and equity off of it. Um, and the thing doesn't even exist. Keep in mind, they've not even poured a foundation yet, right? For this, for this uh, tower, but prices are still going up. How does that happen? Magic. Um, but basically, so this is what condo flipping is. And this is a, I would say it's not a healthy practice um, because if there's first time buyers or if there's, uh, you know, people that want to live in the, the condo that they're booking, if they're the ones that are buying there, it becomes very difficult when investors are holding properties and selling them at a profit, right? It raises the average price of that building and it makes it that much harder for buyers at that time to get in, especially if they're buying for themselves or to live in. So don't love that. Um, but the Liberal government basically, they, again, there's no plan, um, but I mean, there's no explanation or plan, but uh, what I assume is that they're going to uh, tax these investors on the gains. And so I'm an investor myself, right? If you're making money, you got to pay taxes. That's the country we live in. Okay. Um, I think that taxing that would be a fair policy only because, you know, the point is that they want to deter um, condo flippers from doing this. And I think that taxation would be a fair policy for that. If the goal is to make room for first time buyers, right? If the goal is to make room for, um, principal occupiers, people that want to live there themselves. So, uh, for that reason, I would be in support of a policy like that. So if they're able to do that, fantastic. And end of the day, right? Investors, I'm sure I'm going to have at least one investor comment on this and be like, Oh, but we're making money. It's our money. Oh, how can the government tax it? Bro, you live in a place like Canada. We have free healthcare. We have free um, education. We have so much support. We have so much infrastructure. We have all of this. Why? Because people pay taxes. Now I'm not, I don't love taxes. I hate taxes just as anybody, as much as anybody else. But keep in mind, if you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you have to contribute, if you have to, you know, pay taxes to make it legal, so be it. You think businesses don't pay taxes? I might be naive. Maybe some businesses don't, but um, I do. I support it. Um, and taxes is what makes our world run here in Canada. Okay. So unpopular opinion again, but uh, yes, if the liberal government wants to tax condo flippers, I'll be it. One more thing that they have said is that they want to establish the Ontario Home Building Corporation to finance and build much needed affordable homes. That is a good one. The details are, um, they're going to establish yeah, the Ontario Home Building Corporation, tasking it to work with local communities, not-for-profit housing partners and developers to build and maintain affordable homes of all types, uh, either as a primary financing source or builder. Okay, so they're going to help finance and or build these homes through the Ontario Home Building Corporation. Um, the corporation will also develop surplus provincial lands. This is a great one as well. Um, what they want to do is unlock provincial land to build homes on. I think this is vitally important. Um, a lot of provincial land is locked up currently, just owned by the government. Um, that is what should be used to build affordable housing and to support our housing needs. I think this is fantastic if they're able to do this. Uh, the corporation will also develop surplus provincial lands, including safely burying more electric transmission lines under blah, 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 not important. Okay, so there's gonna be a hard cap on administrative um, expenses when they're building and financing these homes on, on government lands. Um, for 15 years, they're gonna have a mandate to ensure that housing is built rapidly and to be able to cool the housing market and end the wait list for affordable public housing. Any home sold by the corporation will be available only to first time home buyers and any proceeds will go directly back into creating affordable homes. So this I think is a fantastic policy. We need policies that help our first time home buyers that help people that don't currently have homes get into home ownership. And I think that this would be fantastic. Um, another thing that they want to do is empower municipalities to accelerate housing projects. Very, very important. Give municipalities money and resources to be able to approve things faster, right? Um, 
They also want to make building homes a priority in growth planning legislation. A lot of cities, a lot of regions, a lot of municipalities in Ontario have already begun their um, their housing studies and housing plans and have had the privilege of reading some and consulting on some. And people know, right? Cities know, officials know we need housing. And so having some government support, which the Liberals say they're going to give, would be fantastic to these communities and, and these cities that want to develop and encourage development um, within their boundaries. Local communities know best when it comes to where and how to build more homes, so we'll make sure that they have the resources they need to approve housing as quickly and responsibly as possible, providing up to 300 million in new funding over five years, which I think is fantastic. Um, and the government will also support the use of community planning permits that help bring more homes to market faster. I think that that is fantastic. Um, they also want to uh, work with municipalities to expand zoning options and to help and reward municipalities that meet or exceed higher housing targets. So that's fantastic. Um, you know, incentivizing anything, whether it's in public life or, or you know, private life, um, incentivizing anything certainly, well, you would hope, certainly makes it go faster, right? So we need, uh, we need housing fast. Um, they say that right now it's almost impossible to build modest family-friendly housing such as semi-detached homes, uh, triplexes, and townhomes across most of Ontario. These exclusionary zoning policies prevent new homes from being built where people want to live. Um, exclusionary zoning talks about if you have an area with detached homes that's only zoned for detached homes, you cannot build a condo there. Uh, you, not a high rise, not a low rise, you can't build townhomes, you can't build semis, nothing, right? And so ending exclusionary zoning um, helps increase gentle density and make communities more vibrant, right? By providing more housing options within the same community. So I think that this is fantastic. Um, as an important step towards zoning reform, we'll work quickly in close collaboration with municipal partners to allow homes with up to three units and two stories to build to be built as of right across the province with this permission also extending to secondary and laneway suites so basically if there is an area with detached homes that's only de zoned for detached homes it will be automatically allowed to build a triplex there right a two-story um three unit house so where you had one family living you now have three families housed we need housing we need good housing. We need housing that's not teeny tiny 400 square feet condo apartments, right? Um, and so I think that this would be a fantastic policy um, and applying it across Ontario would be excellent. Um, the Liberals will also promote housing options near transit stations and along rapid transit routes, which is super important. Transit is the best tool that we have to add more homes to your community without adding more cars, driveways, roads, and parking lots. So they're going to encourage <coughs> the development of low-rise missing middle multiplexes and other mid-rise housing options near rapid transit stations and routes through neighborhood transition zones. So if you have a GO station, for example, Mount Pleasant GO station in, uh, in Brampton, Ontario, you have the infrastructure, you have a way for people to get from there to downtown. Now, not everyone's working in downtown anymore, post-pandemic, I know that, um, but I'm just talking about getting around the city, right? There's infrastructure there, there's schools, there's parks, there's libraries, there's community centers, there's grocery, there's shopping, there's everything, right? It's planned that way. And there's a, there's a transit center, so people can get around, they don't need cars. And so if you don't need cars, you can build a townhouse, right? You don't need a driveway. Um, you don't need a garage. And so this opens up the options. You don't have to make these giant detached homes or even semis, right? You can make townhomes that still feel like homes, still allow affordable home ownership options um, that don't restrict a family to like a one bedroom condo, right? Because they can't, they can't live in a one bedroom condo with two or three or four kids, right? You need a home. Um, and so having this flexibility, especially around transit zones, I think would be fantastic. They also want to convert underutilized industrial and commercial sites into new homes, which is very interesting. Um, they want to allow renters and owners to increase minimum housing per permissions. Not sure what this is about. Um, they want to help existing affordable homes truly affordable. So the affordable we were talking about before, or maybe it was on my last video, um, there's subsidized affordable and market affordable, right? We have to differentiate between that. So they want to maintain the affordability rating of homes, which I think is good. Um, and to also expand and build new co-op housing. So I know I rushed a little bit there at the end. Oh, wait, there's more. 
there's one more. Well, there's four more in this section. One is establish zoning and building code standards for low rise residential developments, create a digital platform for development applications and basically give this to the cities. Implement parking maximums for new buildings within walking distance of rapid transit stations, which I think is a great idea. We talked about that Mount Pleasant going example. Um, excellent. And eliminate backlogs and accelerate dispute resolutions. I presume this is regarding land. Um, so I know I rushed a lot, not a little, a lot at the end, but this is a, a very long video now. Um, however, I will say this, the Ontario Liberal Housing Platform, based on what I've read so far, is a very comprehensive housing policy. I have not looked at any of the other sort of areas um, or any of the other um, categories but the housing related measures uh, some of them make sense some of them don't like I said not everyone in the government knows what they're doing all the time and that's okay um, but some of them do make sense and just like the PCs had some good ideas the liberals also have some good ideas make sure you read them make sure you understand them and please 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 go and vote if you have any questions you can leave them down below um, I'll be sharing links to all of the other political parties videos that I've done um, so you can just basically watch all of them again if you do have questions I probably don't have the answer because this is just you know me going on my understanding um, I don't actually have any standing um, <laughs> with any of these parties but uh, but I will do my best to help explain it to you uh, using my real estate background so thank you very much for watching it to the very end. I know it was a very long video, uh, but I appreciate you being on here with me. We are doing some important work, or so I like to think. I hope that the video was helpful for you. Um, if you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and make sure you hit that subscribe button uh, because I do post new videos all the time. Um, and like I said, this is video number two out of a four part series in advance of this, uh, this year's provincial election. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.